Section 15 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan Dickey. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 15, The Thirtieth Congress. The 30th Congress organized on the 6th of December, 1847. Its role contained the names of many eminent men, few of whom were less known than his which was destined to a fame more wide and enduring than all the rest together. It was Mr. Lincoln's sole distinction that he was the only Whig member from Illinois. He entered upon the larger field of work which now lay before him without any special diffidence, but equally without elation. Writing to his friend Speed soon after his election, he said, quote, Being elected to Congress, though I am very grateful to our friends for having done it, has not pleased me as much as I expected, unquote. An experience not unknown to most public men, but probably intensified in Lincoln's case by his constitutional melancholy. He went about his work with little gladness but with a dogged sincerity and an inflexible conscience. It soon became apparent that the Whigs were to derive at least a temporary advantage from the war which the Democrats had brought upon the country, although it was destined in its later consequences to sweep the former party out of existence and exile the other from power for many years. The House was so closely divided that Lincoln, riding on the fifth, expressed some doubt whether the whigs could elect all their caucus nominees and mr robert c winthrop was chosen speaker the next day by a majority of one vote the president showed in his message that he was doubtful of the verdict of congress and the country upon the year's operations and he argued with more solicitude than force in defense of the proceedings of the administration in regard to the war with mexico his anxiety was at once shown to be well founded the first attempt made by his friends to endorse the conduct of the government was met by a stern rebuke from the house of representatives which passed an amendment proposed by george ashman that quote, the war had been unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the president unquote. this severe declaration was provoked and justified by the persistent and disingenuous assertions of the president that the preceding congress had quote, with virtual unanimity, unquote, declared that, quote, war existed by the act of Mexico, unquote. the truth being that a strong minority had voted to strike out those words from the preamble of the supply bill. But being outvoted in this, they were compelled either to vote for preamble and bill together, or else refuse supplies to the army. It was not surprising that the Whigs and other opponents of the war should take the first opportunity to give the President their opinion of such a misrepresentation. The standing of the opposition had been greatly strengthened by the very victories upon which Mr. Polk had confidently relied for his vindication. Both our armies in Mexico were under the command of Whig generals, and among the subordinate officers who had distinguished themselves in the field, a full share were Whigs, who, to an extent unusual in wars of political significance, retained their attitude of hostility to the administration under whose orders they were serving. Some of them had returned to their places on the floor of Congress, brandishing their laurels, with great effect, in the faces of their opponents who had talked while they fought footnote the following extract from a letter of lincoln to his partner mr herndon who had criticized his anti-war votes gives the names of some of the whig soldiers who persisted in their faith throughout the war quote, as to the whig men who have participated in the war so far as they have spoken to my hearing they do not hesitate to denounce as unjust the president's conduct the beginning of the war they do not suppose that such denunciation is directed by undying hatred to them as the register would have it believed there are two such whigs on this floor colonel haskell and major james the former fought as a colonel by the side of colonel baker at cerro gordo and stands side by side with me in the vote that you seem dissatisfied with the latter the history of whose capture with cassius clay you well know had not arrived here when that vote was given 
but as i understand he stands ready to give just such a vote whenever an occasion shall present baker too who is now here says the truth is undoubtedly that way and whenever he shall speak out he will say so colonel donovan too the favorite whig of missouri and who overran all northern mexico on his return home in a public speech at st louis condemned the administration in relation to the war if i remember g t m davis who has been through almost the whole war declares in favor of mr clay unquote, etc End footnote when we number the names which leaped into sudden fame in that short but sanguinary war it is surprising to find how few of them sympathized with the party who brought it on or with the purposes for which it was waged the earnest opposition of taylor to the scheme of the annexationists did not hamper his movements or paralyze his arm when with his little band of regulars he beat the army of arista on the plain of palo alto and again in the precipitous resaca de la palma took by storm the fortified city of monterey defended by a greatly superior force and finally with a few regiments of raw levies posted among the rocky spurs and gorges about the farm of buena vista met and defeated the best led and the best fought army the mexicans ever brought into the field outnumbering him more than four to one it was only natural that the whigs should profit by the glory gained by whig valor no matter in what cause the attitude of the opposition sure of their advantage and exulting in it was never perhaps more clearly and strongly set forth than in a speech made by mr lincoln near the close of his session he said as general taylor is par excellence the hero of the mexican war and as you democrats say we whigs have always opposed the war you think it must be very awkward and embarrassing for us to go for general taylor the declaration that we have always opposed the war is true or false accordingly as one may understand the term opposing the war if to say the war was unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the president be opposing the war then the whigs have very generally opposed it whenever they have spoken at all they have said this and they have said it on what has appeared good reason to them the marching of an army into the midst of a peaceful mexican settlement frightening the inhabitants away leaving their growing crops and other property to destruction to you may appear a perfectly amiable peaceful unprovoking procedure but it does not appear so to us so to call such an act to us appears no other than a naked impudent absurdity and we speak of it accordingly but if when the war had begun and had become the cause of the country the giving of our money and our blood in common with yours was support of the war then it is not true that we have always opposed the war with few individual exceptions you have constantly had our votes here for all the necessary supplies and more than this you have had the services the blood and the lives of our political brethren in every trial and on every field the beardless boy and the mature man the humble and the distinguished you have had them through suffering and death by disease and in battle they have endured and fought and fallen with you clay and webster each gave a son never to be returned from the state of my own residence besides other worthy but less known whig names we sent marshall morrison baker and hardin they all fought and one fell and in the fall of that one we lost our best whig man nor were the whigs few in number or laggard in the day of danger in that fearful bloody breathless struggle at buena vista where each man's hard task was to beat back five foes or die himself of the five high officers who perished four were whigs there was no refuge for the democrats after the whigs had adopted taylor as their especial hero since scott was also a whig and an original opponent of the war his victories on account of the apparent ease with which they were gained have never received the credit justly due them the student of military history will rarely meet with narratives of battles in any age where the actual operations coincide so exactly with the orders issued upon the eve of conflict as in the official reports of the wonderfully energetic and successful campaign in which general scott with a handful of men renewed the memory of the conquest of cortes in his triumphant march from vera cruz to the capital 
The plan of the Battle of Cerro Gordo was so fully carried out in action that the official report is hardly more than the general orders translated from the future tense to the past. The story of Chapultepec has the same element of the marvelous in it. On one day the general commanded apparent impossibilities in the closest detail, and the next day reported that they had been accomplished. These successes were not cheaply attained. The Mexicans, though deficient in science and in military intelligence, fought with bravery and sometimes with desperation. The enormous percentage of loss in his army proves that Scott was engaged in no light work. He marched from Pueblo with about 10,000 men, and his losses in the Basin of Mexico were 2,703, of whom 383 were officers. But neither he nor Taylor was a favorite of the administration, and their brilliant success brought no gain of popularity to Mr. Polk and his cabinet. During the early part of the session, little was talked about except the Mexican War, its causes, its prosecution, and its probable results. In these wordy engagements, the Whigs, partly for the reasons we have mentioned, partly through their unquestionable superiority in debate, and partly by virtue of their stronger cause, usually had the advantage. There was no distinct line of demarcation, however, between the two parties. There was hardly a vote, after the election of Mr. Winthrop as Speaker, where the two sides divided according to their partisan nomenclature. The question of slavery, even where its presence was not avowed, had its secret influence upon every trial of strength in Congress, and Southern Whigs were continually found sustaining the President, and New England Democrats voting against his most cherished plans. Not even all the Democrats of the South could be relied on by the administration. The most powerful leader of them all denounced with bitter earnestness the conduct of the war, for which he was greatly responsible. Mr. Calhoun, in an attack upon the President's policy, January 4, 1848, said, quote, I opposed the war, not only because it might have been easily avoided, not only because the President had no authority to order a part of the disputed territory in possession of the Mexicans to be occupied by our troops, not only because I believed the allegations upon which Congress sanctioned the war untrue, but from high considerations of policy, because I believed it would lead to many and serious evils to the country and greatly endanger its free institutions. It was probably not so much the free institutions of the country that the South Carolina senator was disturbed about as some others. He perhaps felt that the friends of slavery had set in motion a train of events whose result was beyond their ken. Mr. Palfrey of Massachusetts, a few days later, said with as much sagacity as wit that, quote, Mr. Calhoun thought that he could set fire to a barrel of gunpowder and extinguish it when half consumed, unquote. In his anxiety that the war should be brought to an end, Calhoun proposed that the United States Army should evacuate the Mexican capital, establish a defensive line, and hold it as the only indemnity possible to us. He had no confidence in treaties, and believed that no Mexican government was capable of carrying one into effect. A few days later, in a running debate, Mr. Calhoun made an important statement, which still further strengthened the contention of the Whigs. He said that in making the treaty of annexation, he did not assume that the Rio del Norte was the western boundary of Texas. On the contrary, he assumed that the boundary was an unsettled one between Mexico and Texas, and that he had intimated to our charge d'affaires that we were prepared to settle the boundary on the most liberal terms. This was perfectly in accordance with the position held by most Democrats before the Rio Grande boundary was made an article of faith by the President. C. J. Ingersoll, one of the leading men upon that side in Congress, in a speech three years before had said, The stupendous deserts between the Nueces and the Bravo rivers are the natural boundaries between the Anglo-Saxon and the Mauritanian races a statement which, however faulty from the point of view of ethnology and physical geography, shows clearly enough the view then held of the boundary question. 
The discipline of both parties was more or less relaxed under the influence of the slavery question. It was singular to see Mr. McLean of Baltimore rebuking Mr. Clingman of North Carolina for mentioning that forbidden subject on the floor of the House. Reverend D. Johnson, a Whig from Maryland, administering correction to John B. Hale, an insubordinate Democrat from New Hampshire, for the same offense, and at the same time screaming that the blood of our glorious battlefields in Mexico rested on the hands of the President, Mr. Clingman challenging the House with the broad statement that, quote, it is a misnomer to speak of our institution at the South as peculiar. Ours is the general system of the world, and the free system is the peculiar one, unquote and Mr. Palfrey dryly responding that slavery was natural, just as barbarism was, just as fig leaves and bare skins were a natural dress. When the time arrived, however, for leaving off grimacing and posturing, and the House went to voting, the advocates of slavery usually carried the day, as the South, Whigs, and Democrats together voted solidly, and the North was divided. Especially was this the case after the arrival of the Treaty of Peace between the United States and Mexico, which was signed at Guadalupe Hidalgo on the 2nd of February, and was in the hands of the Senate only twenty days later. It was ratified by that body on the 10th of March, with a series of amendments which were at once accepted by Mexico, and the Treaty of Peace was officially promulgated on the National Festival of the 4th of July. From the hour when the treaty was received in Washington, however, the discussion as to the conduct of the war naturally languished. The ablest speeches of the day before became obsolete in the presence of accomplished facts, and the interest of Congress promptly turned to the more important subject of the disposition to be made of the vast domain which our arms had conquered, and the treaty confirmed to us. No one in America then realized the magnitude of this acquisition. Its stupendous physical features were as little appreciated as the vast moral and political results which were to flow from its absorption into our commonwealth. It was only known, in general terms, that our new possessions covered ten degrees of latitude and fifteen of longitude that we had acquired, in short, 630,000 square miles of desert, mountain, and wilderness. There was no dream, then, of that portentous discovery which, even while the Senate was wrangling over the treaty, had converted Captain Sutter's mill at Coloma into a mining camp for his ruin and the sudden upbuilding of many colossal fortunes. The name of California, which conveys today such opulent suggestions, then meant nothing but barrenness, and Nevada was a name as yet unknown. Some future congressman, innocent of taste and of Spanish, was to hit upon the absurdity of calling that land of silver and cactus, of the orange and the sage hen, the land of snow. But imperfect as was the appreciation, at that day, of the possibilities which lay hidden in those sunset regions, there was still enough of instinctive greed in the minds of politicians to make the new realm a subject of lively interest and intrigue. Footnote. To show how crude and vague were the ideas of even the most intelligent men in relation to this great empire, we give a few lines from the closing page of Edward D. Mansfield's History of the Mexican War, published in 1849. Quote, but will the greater part of this vast space ever be inhabited by any but the restless hunter and the wandering trapper? Two hundred thousand square miles of this territory, in New California, has been trod by the foot of no civilized being. No spy or pioneer or vagrant trapper has ever returned to report the character and scenery of that waste and lonely wilderness. Two hundred thousand square miles more are occupied with broken mountains and dreary wilds, but little remains, then, for civilization. Unquote. End footnote. At the first showing of hands, the South was successful. In the twenty-ninth Congress, this contest had begun over the spoils of a victory not yet achieved. President Polk, foreseeing the probability of an acquisition of territory by treaty, had asked Congress to make an appropriation for that purpose. A bill was at once reported in that sense, appropriating $30,000 for the expenses of the negotiation, 
and two million dollars to be used in the president's discretion but before it passed a number of northern democrats had become alarmed as to the disposition that might be made of the territory thus acquired which was now free soil by mexican law footnote some of the more conspicuous york wilmot of pennsylvania among them were hamlin of brinkerhoff of ohio and mcclell maine preston king of newland of michigan End footnote. after a hasty consultation they agreed upon a proviso to the bill which was presented by david wilmot of pennsylvania he was a man of respectable abilities who then and long afterwards held a somewhat prominent position among the public men of his state but his chief claim to a place in history rests upon these few lines which he moved to add to the first section of the bill under discussion provided that as an express and fundamental condition to the acquisition of any territory from the republic of mexico by the united states by virtue of any treaty that may be negotiated between them and to the use by the executive of the monies herein appropriated neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in any part of said territory except for crime whereof the party shall first be duly convicted this condition seemed so fair when first presented to the northern conscience that only three members from the free states voted no in committee the amendment was adopted eighty to sixty four and the bill reported to the house a desperate effort was then made by the pro-slavery members to kill the bill for the purpose of destroying the amendment with it this failed and the bill as amended passed the house but going to the senate a few hours before the close of the session it lapsed without a vote footnote in this important and significant vote all the whigs but one and almost all the democrats from the free states together with william p thomason and henry grider whigs from kentucky voted against killing the amended bill in all ninety-three on the other side were all the members from slave-holding states except thomason and grider and the following from free states douglas and john a mcclernand from illinois pettit from indiana and shenick a whig from ohio in all seventy nine from greeley's american conflict volume one page one hundred eighty nine end footnote as soon as the war was ended and the treaty of peace was sent to the senate this subject assumed a new interest and importance and a resolution embodying the principle of the wilmot proviso was brought before the house by mr harvey putnam of new york but no longer with the same success the south was now solid against it and such a disintegration of conscience among northern democrats had set in that whereas only three of them in the last congress had seen fit to approve the introduction of slavery into free territory twenty-five now voted with the south against maintaining the existing conditions there the fight was kept up during the session in various places if now and then a temporary advantage seemed gained in the house it was lost in the senate and no permanent progress was made what we have said in regard to the general discussion provoked by the mexican war appeared necessary to explain the part taken by mr lincoln on the floor he came to his place unheralded and without any special personal pretensions his first participation in debate can best be described in his own quaint and simple words Quote, as to speech-making by way of getting the hang of the house i made a little speech two or three days ago on a post-office question of no general interest i find speaking here and elsewhere about the same thing i was about as badly scared and no worse as i am when i speak in court i expect to make one within a week or two in which i hope to succeed well enough to wish you to see it Unquote. he evidently had the orator's temperament the mixture of dread and eagerness which all good speakers feel before facing an audience which made cicero tremble and turn pale when rising in the forum the speech he was pondering was made only four days later on the twelfth of january and few better maiden speeches for it was his first formal discourse in congress have ever been made in that house 
he preceded it and prepared for it by the introduction on the twenty second of december of a series of resolutions referring to the president's persistent assertions that the war had been begun by mexico Quote, by invading our territory and shedding the blood of our citizens on our own soil unquote, and calling upon him to give the house more specific information upon these points as these resolutions became somewhat famous afterwards and were relied upon to sustain the charge of a lack of patriotism made by mr douglas against their author it may be as well to give them here especially as they are the first production of mr lincoln's pen after his entry upon the field of national politics we omit the preamble which consists of quotations from the president's message resolved by the house of representatives that the president of the united states be respectfully requested to inform this house first whether the spot on which the blood of our citizens was shed as in his messages declared was or was not within the territory of spain at least after the treaty of eighteen nineteen until the mexican revolution second whether that spot is or is not within the territory which was wrested from spain by the revolutionary government of mexico third whether that spot is or is not within a settlement of people which settlement has existed ever since long before the texas revolution and until its inhabitants fled before the approach of the united states army fourth whether that settlement is or is not isolated from any and all other settlements by the gulf and the rio grande on the south and west and by wide uninhabited regions in the north and east fifth whether the people of that settlement or a majority of them or any of them have ever submitted themselves to the government or laws of texas or of the united states by consent or by compulsion either by accepting office or voting at elections or paying tax or serving on juries or having process served upon them or in any other way sixth whether the people of that settlement did or did not flee from the approach of the united states army leaving unprotected their homes and their growing crops before the blood was shed as in the messages stated and whether the first blood so shed was or was not shed within the enclosure of one of the people who had thus fled from it seventh whether our citizens whose blood was shed as in his messages declared were or were not at that time armed officers and soldiers sent into that settlement by the military order of the president through the secretary of war eighth whether the military force of the united states was or was not so sent into that settlement after general taylor had more than once intimated to the war department that in his opinion no such movement was necessary to the defense or protection of texas it would have been impossible for the president to answer these questions one by one according to the evidence in his possession without surrendering every position he had taken in his messages for the last two years an answer was probably not expected the resolutions were never acted upon by the house the vote on the ashman proposition having sufficiently indicated the view which the majority held of the president's precipitate and unconstitutional proceeding but they served as a text for the speech which lincoln made in committee of the whole which deserves the attentive reading of any one who imagines that there was anything accidental in the ascendancy which he held for twenty years among the public men of illinois the winter was mostly devoted to speeches upon the same subject from men of eminence and experience but it is within bounds to say there was not a speech made in the house that year superior to this in clearness of statement severity of criticism combined with soberness of style or what is most surprising finish and correctness in its close clear argument its felicity of illustration its restrained yet burning earnestness it belongs to precisely the same class of addresses as those which he made a dozen years later 
the ordinary congressman can never conclude inside the limits assigned him he must beg for unanimous consent for an extension of time to complete his sprawling peroration but this masterly speech covered the whole ground of the controversy and so intent was lincoln on not exceeding his hour that he finished his task to his own surprise in forty-five minutes it is an admirable discourse and the oblivion which overtook it along with the volumes of other speeches made at the same time can be accounted for only by remembering that the guadalupe treaty came suddenly in upon the debate with its immense consequences sweeping forever out of view all consideration of the causes and the processes which led to the momentous result lincoln's speech and his resolutions were alike inspired with one purpose to correct what he considered an error and a wrong to rectify a misrepresentation which he could not in his very nature permit to go uncontradicted it gratified his offended moral sense to protest against the false pretenses which he saw so clearly and it pleased his fancy as a lawyer to bring a truth to light which somebody as he thought was trying to conceal he certainly got no other reward for his trouble his speech was not particularly well received in illinois his own partner mr herndon a young and ardent man with more heart than learning more feeling for the flag than for international justice could not or would not understand mr lincoln's position and gave him great pain by his letters again and again lincoln explained to him the difference between approving the war and voting supplies to the soldiers but herndon was obstinately obtuse and there were many of his mind lincoln's convictions were so positive in regard to the matter that any laxity of opinion among his friends caused him real suffering in a letter to the rev j m peck who had written a defense of the administration in reference to the origin of the war he writes this quote, disappoints me because it is the first effort of the kind i have known made by one appearing to me to be intelligent right-minded and impartial unquote. he then reviews some of the statements of mr peck proving their incorrectness and goes on to show that our army had marched under orders across the desert of the nueces into a peaceful mexican settlement frightening away the inhabitants that fort brown was built in a mexican cotton field where a young crop was growing that captain thornton and his men were captured in another cultivated field he then asks how under any law human or divine this can be considered no aggression and closes by asking his clerical correspondent if the precept quote, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you do you even so to them unquote, is obsolete of no force of no application this is not the anxiety of a politician troubled about his record he is not a candidate for re-election and the discussion has passed by but he must stop and vindicate the truth whenever assailed he perhaps does not see certainly does not care that this stubborn devotion to mere justice will do him no good at an hour when the air is full of the fumes of gunpowder when the returned volunteers are running for constable in every county when so good a wig as mr winthrop gives as a sentiment at a public meeting in boston quote, our country however bounded unquote, and the majority of his party are preparing unmindful of mr polk and all his works to reap the fruits of the mexican war by making its popular hero president it was fortunate for mr lincoln and for whigs like him with consciences that general taylor had occupied so unequivocal an attitude in regard to the war he had not been in favor of the march to the rio grande and had resisted every suggestion to that effect until his peremptory orders came in regard to other political questions his position was so undefined and his silence generally so discreet that few of the whigs however exacting could find any difficulty in supporting him mr lincoln did more than tolerate his candidacy he supported it with energy and cordiality he was at last convinced that the election of mr clay was impossible and he thought he could see that the one opportunity of the whigs was in the nomination of taylor so early as april he wrote to a friend quote, 
Mr. Clay's chance for an election is just no chance at all. He might get New York, and that would have elected in 1844, but it will not now, because he must now, at the least, lose Tennessee, which he had then, and in addition the fifteen new votes of Florida, Texas, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Unquote. Later he wrote to the same friend that the nomination took the Democrats, quote, on the blind side. It turns the war thunder against them. The war is now to them the gallows of Haman, which they built for us, and on which they are doomed to be hanged themselves. Unquote. At the same time, he baited no jot of his opposition to the war, and urged the same course upon his friends. To Linder of Illinois, he wrote, quote, in law, it is good policy to never plead what you need not, lest you oblige yourself to prove what you cannot. Unquote. He then counseled him to go for Taylor, but to avoid approving Polk and the war, as in the former case he would gain Democratic votes, and in the latter he would lose with the Whigs. Linder answered him, wanting to know if it would not be as easy to elect Taylor without opposing the war which drew from Lincoln the angry response that silence was impossible. The Whigs must speak, quote, and their only option is whether they will, when they speak, tell the truth or tell a foul and villainous falsehood, unquote. When the Whig convention came together in Philadelphia, the differences of opinion on points of principle and policy were almost as numerous as the delegates. The unconditional Clay men rallied once more and gave their aged leader 97 votes to 111, which Taylor received on the first ballot. Scott and Webster had each a few votes, but on the fourth ballot the soldier of Buena Vista was nominated, and Millard Fillmore placed in the line of succession to him. It was impossible for a body so heterogeneous to put forward a distinctive platform of principles. An attempt was made to force an expression in regard to the Wilmot Proviso, but it was never permitted to come to a vote. The convention was determined that, quote, old rough and ready, unquote, as he was now universally nicknamed, should run upon his battle flags and his name of Whig, although he cautiously called himself, quote, not an ultra Whig. Unquote. The nomination was received with great and noisy demonstrations of adhesion from every quarter. Lincoln, writing a day or two after his return from the convention, said, quote, Many had said they would not abide the nomination of Taylor, but since the deed has been done, they are fast falling in, and in my opinion, we shall have a most overwhelming, glorious triumph. One unmistakable sign is that all the odds and ends are with us. Barn burners, Native Americans, Tyler men, disappointed office-seeking locofocos, and the Lord knows what. This is important, if in nothing else, in showing which way the wind blows. Unquote. General Taylor's chances for election had been greatly increased by what had taken place at the Democratic Convention a fortnight before. General Cass had been nominated for the presidency, but his militia title had no glamour of carnage about it, and the secession of the New York anti-slavery barn burners from the convention was a presage of disaster which was fulfilled in the following August by the assembling of the recusant delegates at Buffalo, where they were joined by a large number of discontented Democrats and Liberty men and the Free Soil Party was organized for its short but effective mission. Martin Van Buren was nominated for president, and Charles Francis Adams was associated with him on the ticket. The great superiority of caliber shown in the nominations of the mutineers over the regular Democrats was also apparent in the role of those who made and sustained the revolt. When Salmon P. Chase, Preston King, the Van Burens, John P. Hale, William Cullen Bryant, David Wilmot, and their like, went out of their party, they left a vacancy which was never to be filled. It was, perhaps, an instinct rather than any clear spirit of prophecy which drove the anti-slavery Democrats away from their affiliations and kept the Whigs, for the moment, substantially together. 
So far as the authorized utterances of their conventions were concerned, there was little to choose between them. They had both evaded any profession of faith in regard to slavery. The Democrats had rejected the resolution offered by Yancey, committing them to the doctrine of, quote, non-interference with the rights of property in the territories, unquote. And the Whigs had never allowed the Wilmot Proviso to be voted upon. But nevertheless, those Democrats who felt that the time had come to put a stop to the aggression of slavery generally threw off their partisan allegiance, and the most ardent of the anti-slavery Whigs, with some exceptions it is true, especially in Ohio and in Massachusetts, where the strength of the conscience Whigs led by Sumner, the Adamses, and Henry Wilson, was important, thought best to remain with their party. General Taylor was a Southerner and a slaveholder. In regard to all questions bearing upon slavery, he observed a discretion in the canvas, which was almost ludicrous. Footnote. It is a tradition that a planter once wrote to him, quote, I have worked hard and been frugal all my life, and the results of my industry have mainly taken the form of slaves, of whom I own about a hundred. Before I vote for president, I want to be sure that the candidate I support will not so act as to divest me of my property. Unquote. To which the general, with a dexterity that would have done credit to a diplomatist and would have proved exceedingly useful to Mr. Clay, responded, quote, Sir, I have the honor to inform you that I too have been all my life industrious and frugal, and that the fruits thereof are mainly invested in slaves, of whom I own three hundred, yours, etc. Unquote. From Horace Greeley, American Conflict, Volume 1, page 193. End footnote. Yet there was a well-nigh universal impression among the anti-slavery Whigs that his administration would be under influences favorable to the restriction of slavery. Clay, Webster, and Seward, all of whom were agreed at that time against any extension of the area of that institution, supported him with more or less cordiality. Webster insisted upon it that the Whigs were themselves the best free soilers, and for them to join the party called by that distinctive name would be merely putting Mr. Van Buren at the head of the Whig party. Mr. Seward, speaking for Taylor at Cleveland, took still stronger ground, declaring that slavery quote, must be abolished, unquote. that, quote, freedom and slavery are two antagonistic elements of society in America, unquote. that, quote, the party of freedom seeks complete and universal emancipation, unquote. No one then seems to have foreseen that the Whig party, then on the eve of a great victory, was so near its dissolution, and that the bolting Democrats and the faithful Whigs were alike engaged in laying the foundations of a party which was to glorify the latter half of the century with achievements of such colossal and enduring importance. There was certainly no doubt or misgiving in the mind of Lincoln as to that future which, if he could have foreseen it, would have presented so much of terrible fascination. He went into the campaign with exultant alacrity. He could not even wait for the adjournment of Congress to begin his stump speaking. Following the bad example of the rest of his colleagues, he obtained the floor on the 27th of July, and made a long, brilliant, and humorous speech upon the merits of the two candidates before the people. As it is the only one of Lincoln's popular speeches of that period which has been preserved entire, it should be read by those who desire to understand the manner and spirit of the politics of 1848. Whatever faults of taste or of method may be found in it, considering it as a speech delivered in the House of Representatives, with no more propriety or pertinence than hundreds of others which have been made under like circumstances, it is an extremely able speech and it is by itself enough to show how remarkably effective he must have been as a canvasser in the remoter districts of his state where means of intellectual excitement were rare and a political meeting was the best known form of public entertainment he begins by making a clear brief and dignified defense of the position of taylor upon the question of the proper use of the veto he then avows with characteristic candor that he does not know what general taylor will do as to slavery he is himself a northern man or rather 
a western free state man with a constituency i believe to be and with personal feelings i know to be against the extension of slavery a definition in which his caution and his honesty are equally displayed and he hopes general taylor would not if elected do anything against its restriction but he would vote for him in any case as offering better guarantees than mr cass he then enters upon an analysis of the position of cass and his party which is full of keen observation and political intelligence and his speech goes on to its rollicking close with a constant succession of bright witty and striking passages in which the orator's own conviction and enjoyment of an assured success is not the least remarkable feature a few weeks later congress adjourned and lincoln without returning home entered upon the canvas in new england and then going to illinois spoke night and day until the election footnote thurlow weed says in his autobiography volume one page six hundred three quote, i had supposed until we now met that i had never seen mr lincoln having forgotten that in the fall of eighteen forty eight when he took the stump in new england he called upon me at albany and that we went to see mr fillmore who was then the whig candidate for vice president Unquote. the new york tribune september fourteenth eighteen forty eight mentions mr lincoln as addressing a great whig meeting in boston september twelfth the boston atlas refers to speeches made by him at dorchester september sixteen at chelsea september seventeen by lincoln and seward at boston september twenty second on which occasion the report says quote, mr lincoln of illinois next came forward and was received with great applause he spoke about an hour and made a powerful and convincing speech which was cheered to the echo unquote. Mr. Robert C. Winthrop, Jr., in his recent memoir of the Honorable David Sears, says the most brilliant of Mr. Lincoln's speeches in this campaign, quote, was delivered at Worcester, September 13, 1848, when, after taking for his text Mr. Webster's remark that the nomination of Martin Van Buren for the presidency by a professed anti-slavery party could fitly be regarded only as a trick or a joke, Mr. Lincoln proceeded to declare that of the three parties then asking the confidence of the country, the new one had less of principle than any other, adding, amid shouts of laughter, that the recently constructed elastic free soil platform reminded him of nothing so much as the pair of trousers offered for sale by a Yankee peddler which were large enough for any man and small enough for any boy. It is evident that he considered Van Buren, in Massachusetts at least, a candidate more to be feared than Cass, the regular Democratic nominee. End footnote. When the votes were counted, the extent of the defection among the Northern Whigs and Democrats who voted for Van Buren and among the Southern Democrats who had been beguiled by the epaulets of Taylor was plainly seen. The bolting barn burners had given New York to Taylor. The free soil vote in Ohio, on the other hand, had thrown that state to Cass. Van Buren carried no electors, but his popular vote was larger in New York and Massachusetts than that of Cass. The entire popular vote, exclusive of South Carolina, which chose its electors by the legislature, was for Taylor 1,360,752, for Cass 1,219,962, for Van Buren 291,342. Of the electors, Taylor had 163 and Cass 100. 37. End of section 15. Recording by Nathan Dickey, Ashland, Oregon.